noise in case you still have them open please mute them unless you are talking so we do not have background noises thank you Okay, I think we are live already. So welcome everybody again. Um, we had a very interesting um, yeah, presentation this afternoon in this agrobiodiversity session. We are continuing now tonight already here in Germany. It's now 6 p.m. Uh, the sun is about to set in a few hours. Um, but I guess you are all still uh, live and wide awake and very interested in our presentation because you should be actually. We got very cool poster presentations coming up with a very wide set of topics, just like biodiversity is a very wide um, yeah, topic in such uh, in terms of diversity. Also our topics and our presentations here on this poster sessions reflect this diversity. And I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, be reminded again, please use the Uber app and the Q&A section to ask your questions. Um, and our presenters are more than happy if you ask a lot of questions. And of course, you can always also directly contact them if you're interested in, in some conversations and some digital or real life coffee drinking um, or even future collaborations. So I wish you all a nice session. We will start um, directly with a talk which um, was planned to be given by Stefan Burkhardt, but instead um, we have Jose um, Correa who's going to present this and um, he's going to talk about ICTs in agriculture and the role of ICTs um, for broader access to tropical forage knowledge. And we're looking forward to your presentation, which in this case will be even given live, so directly right now. And afterwards, we will also have video presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Ingo. I'm going to share my screen now. So I hope you're seeing right now the yes, screen. Perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as you said, my presentation in and together with my colleagues, I welcome to you our poster on ICTs in agriculture the state of the art tools for broader access to tropical forest knowledge. First of all, a quick context. The access of, to scientific knowledge has greatly increased with the development of information and communication technologies and wider internet connectivity. However, this also comes along with bottlenecks such, such as quality issues, affordability, like restricted access to publication or download payments or an increasing number of predatory publishers. In order to provide high quality tropical forest knowledge to a wide group of, st of stakeholders, the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, SEAT, and its partners developed two informa important information tools. The first is Tropical Grasslands for High Tropicales, an international online peer review and bilingual journal that, com that complies with open access principles. You don't have to pay for subscription or publication fees and contains more than 30 years of scientific publications. We publish papers reviewed by the world's leading tropical forest scientists and is indexed in the most recognized databases and journal metrics. We also provide access to all papers published by the former tropical former journals, Tropical Grasslands, published by the Tropical Grasslands Society of Australia, Pasturas Tropicales, that was published by SIAT, and Genetic Resources Communications, published formerly by CSIRO Tropical Agriculture. The second tool is Tropical Forages, a tool for selecting optimal forage species for local conditions. It provides detailed information on 172 forage species with potential for, to, for use in animal production, which were identified and characterized by global leaders in, on tropical forage research. This includes, for instance, information on morphology, distribution, application, agronomic management, traditional and nutritional value, productive potential, or promising accessions, among other characteristics. A set of 19 variables allows users to filter through the species to refine a short list for their specific local conditions. It's a priceless source of information for researchers, extension services, practitioners, or farmers seeking to improve animal productivity and sustainability. Both tools have remarkable achievements. Uh, for instance, since its inception, the journal has shown sustained growth reaching more than 228,000 visits in 2019 alone and have remarkable, remarkable metrics, as you can see. It was verified by, as a Romeo Green Journal, which confirms it opened a gold open access status. On the, side, on the side of tropical forages, since its first version launched in 2005, 
has become one of the specialized databases most widely used with 350,000 annual visits and cited with 450 citations in scientific publications. It's important to mention that you can, you as a user can also request seed samples for trials from the linked CGR gene banks like SEAD in Colombia and Ilori in Ethiopia, mostly free of charge. Finally, the outlook of, for the tools includes the goal of the journal to become a global benchmark in forage research by supporting the publication of results from the global tropics and by following rigorous scientific standards. In addition, by constantly improving its metrics and reputation, the journal aims to lead a global information exchange platform and to facilitate tropical forages networking with subsequent benefits for research and development. On the side of tropical forages, is it good to mention that recently have a comprehensive update that includes redesign, revision, and additional fact sheets, update of the photo library, and recalibration of the selection tool. A key feature of the new edition is an update of the technology platform to enable its access on mobile devices on web browsers without additional software. So that's all I want to show you by this time. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward if you have questions. DRC, thanks a lot. That was very, very cool. Uh, I'm much impressed, actually. Um, honestly, I was not fully aware of the Tropical Forages uh, database so far, but this is also because um, I'm, I'm more working on, the, on other kind of aspects um, related to plants, not so much on forages. But um, maybe one question to this directly, how can we contribute? Can we also contribute data to this database? Are you interested in this? Yeah, of course. In the case of tropical forages, we also uh, open to receive feedback or contributions to improve the database. We have an, an email that you can access through the website and telling us if you have any remarks, uh, feedback, or any any anything else. Also, as as I can I mentioned, if you're a practitioner or want to research on uh, specific seeds, you can also request these seeds to or in, to a, the gene bank of Seattle or, or Italy. Brilliant. Yeah, so a really cool resource in addition to a very, very interesting journal. Um, I also think this is a great initiative and uh, really impressive um, how this is already taken up in such a relatively short time yeah, with the number of accesses and contributions. So that's very cool. Um, further questions from maybe the other presenters or also from the Hoover app. I'm looking into it right now. Yeah, I think there's there's no questions so far, but this may be also due to a slight time delay. Please, uh, nonetheless, always ask your questions also on the app. Um, questions from the other presenters. Okay, if this is not the case, um, Jose, thanks a lot. I took some notes on these uh, databases and we'll Google them actually later on. Um, so uh, thanks a lot. And we continue then directly with the next presentation which is by uh, Teresa Lizakova. And uh, Teresa actually did an interesting research on the effectiveness of Czech uh, NGOs and public pressure on the protection of rainforests in developing countries. And I'm very much looking forward um, yeah, to the role that NGOs play in these processes. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Teresa Lisakova and I would like to briefly introduce you the research on the effectiveness of Czech NGOs and public pressure on the protection of rainforests in developing countries, supervised by Dr. Ratinger. The main purpose of this research was to study the attitudes, opinions and activities of Czech NGOs related to deforestation caused by a high world demand for Indonesian palm oil and Brazilian soy and beef meat. The coverage of this topic in the Czech Republic and the contribution of Czech NGOs to improve the environmental situation of developing countries. In-depth face-to-face and phone interviews were conducted with the representatives of local Czech NGOs. The interviews were then recorded, transcribed and analyzed using the content analysis technique. All NGOs participating in the research have a substantial influence both in the Czech Republic and within an international reach. The main problems related to the study commodities production have two aspects. The deforestation, loss of biodiversity, land degradation and pollution represent the concerns 
of the global community, while the livelihood of small growers, generating income via production, social conflicts and eradication of poverty represent local interests and concerns. Based on the research findings, the NGO main activities are to exert pressure on local governments and oversee the trade regulation in the case countries as well as the Czech Republic and the EU. Uh, they provide support and aid of the local interests. They promote trade ban from illegal plantations via pressure on suppliers and global companies and they raise awareness among people of the importance of decreased consumption. To conclude, the topic is covered by many Czech NGOs, including small projects and large platforms. NGOs operate directly in the Czech Republic, some of them also in Indonesia or Brazil. The approach of NGOs differ. Some take slower, more educative approach, while others take more radical approaches. The campaign related to the adverse impact of palm oil production was successful in the Czech Republic among the public. Impacts of meat consumption topic is relatively new for the Czech NGOs. People in general do not know that animal feed might contain soybeans from areas connected with deforestation. Thus, this campaign on this topic shall be intensified. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, this was a very, very um, interesting contribution, actually, Teresa. Thanks a lot there um, for giving us these insights. Um, first of all, I would like to open the floor to questions here from our co-listeners and also from our listeners out there on YouTube. So let's see if there are questions directly here. Okay, I don't see them right now. Um, in any case, um, I would like to know, I mean, these NGOs, you said, they also have a certain pressure to ban illegal activities. Um, I'm, I'm not so much informed there actually on this, but I could imagine that this can also be pretty dangerous in some situations, depending uh, against whom you are acting or against whom you make a protest and try to, to have an efficient ban of illegal activities. Um, so, um, yeah, how, how can NGOs cope with this? I mean, what is the, say, acceptable within the risks that you're willing to take to, to ban illegal logging, deforestation? And, um, of course, some of these uh, activities and people who do them are pretty ruthless. Yeah, they are also pretty dangerous. So how to cope with this? Yeah, 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 you are, you are, you are right, basically. Um, the approach really differs. Um, it's, a, it's a case by case uh, on each NGOs as some of them are not taking this radical approach as um, maybe they might be afraid of the consequences. So they take like a more educative and um, probably not so radical approaches, but some of them might. And um, it uh, can be, for instance, uh, like strikes or um, they are doing like um, uh, certain activities directly in their countries which, uh, which contains, uh, for instance, like a patrolling. So they are trying to prevent uh, these events uh, to happen, basically. Yes, okay, so directly together also with local communities and local farmers and- exactly. uh, Yeah, yeah. But it's a uh, super important work, definitely. Um, and I admire it a lot. So thanks a lot for giving us these insights. Thank you. We have further questions. Um, I'm going to write them on the Q&A or send them directly also to the presenters of today's session um, because I think their work definitely merits also questions as well. Okay, so thanks a lot. Um, given that time proceeds and I don't see a question in Wuba right now, I would also proceed with the next presentation, which is um, given by Dita Mervatova. Um, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last names actually. Um, it's not so, so easy always as a German. Um, and this is about the genetic diversity of Aguaye, so Mauritia flexosa in Peruvian and Ecuadorian Amazon. So turning back to plants and genetic diversity, we're looking forward to this presentation.
Dear auditors, my name is Dita Mervartová and I would like to introduce you the brief presentation which topic is genetic diversity of Mauritia flexosa aguaje in Peruvian and Ecuador and Amazon. Mauritia flexosa in Peru called aguaje is a diverse plant from familiar case native to Amazon region and it's very important for local communities because people depend on its nutritive fruit. The objectives of the research are as follows to assess the intra and interpopulation genetic diversity of Mauritia flexosa in Peruvian and Ecuadorian Amazon by SSR Marcus at large Marcus to determine the genetic structure of sampled populations to find the correlation between geographical distances and genetic diversity among selected provenances and individuals and to compare genetic variability among wild and cultivated populations and among populations collected on the plantations managed by National Peruvian Research Institution. Samples were collected between June and September 2019 in Peruvian and Ecuador in Amazon, and the small pieces of leaves were stored and dried afterwards in plastic tubes containing silica gel. A laboratory work was provided at the University of Life Sciences Prague, and firstly, the DNA extraction using the CDEP method, according to Dole, was done. And consequently, it was necessary to find out the optimal annealing temperature for PCR. And that we could start with microsatellite analysis. Finally, various softwares were used for data analysis. Totally, there were collected 147 samples from 15 populations and 5 regions, such as Ucayali, Huanuco, San Martin, Loreto, and the 5th post Ecuador, and from 13 provenances, meaning in this case, sample geographical locality. All populations are characterized by high values of genetic diversity, and totally observed heterozygosity was lower than the expected one, and very interesting in this case were high values of gene flow, Otherwise, the coefficient of inbreeding was not significant. The high molecular variance was determined especially among and within the individuals, and according to all results, there was not significantly different genetic composition among populations determined. The results are explained by high gene flow along Amazon rainforest, which can be nature, but also it could be caused by human and is activated during the history. And the rivers figure as by corridors, and they are very important for genetic diversity of native species. The conclusion is that Mauritia flexosa is not endangered from the point of view of genetics so far, which is very really useful in the case of adaptation to longer dry periods in the tropics, which is a really huge problem there nowadays. Uh, seven out of used ASSM primers could be recommended for further genetic studies for cures on Mauritia flexosa. And of course, there are several recommendations like cultivation of Mauritia in agroforestry systems and to protect also the river basins, various streams and so on, because they contribute to gentle diversity, not only of Mauritia flexosa. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I would be glad to answer your questions you might have about the research. Thank you very much, Dita, for this very insightful study on genetic and gene flow of this interesting plant species. Um, so I was wondering, actually, um, so if I've understood you correctly right now, the genetics do not really seem to harm the population dynamics of the plant species. Or is there any indication that inbreeding could actually affect the population dynamics of this plant species? So as may be the case, if there is, say, um, large dam projects um, in these river systems and then inbreeding increases because of um, a loss of gene flow. Is this an issue? Sorry, I just, I think that it, didn't, it doesn't work well, the connection here, so maybe if you can repeat the question, sorry. I was wondering, is uh, inbreeding an, an issue or is inbreeding a problem that could affect the population um, of this plant species? Um, right now, inbreeding does not seem to be the case, but it could change in future with human activities. Yeah, sure, of course, there could be a problem with the breeding effects in general, because uh, then, for example, if we have, for example, two several uh, isolated populations, so that it might be a problem, then it may be a bit great, for example, in a subspecies in, mm -hmm. in several years and so on. 
And I think that nowadays it's pretty important to adapt the, uh, let's say, climate changes and so on. And that's the reason why I think that it's very important to have some things and stuff like that. Mm. And uh, for example, in this case with Aguaje, so uh, I think that it breeding effect in this case is not pretty cool. So it's much, much better if we have some really good gene flow and so on and in connection with rivers and so on it's very, very important i think so mm -hmm. and uh, how much um, could this specific plant species actually be like an indicator species for these processes in general so like uh, also maybe a, a warning system for disruption of gene flow which may also affect other plants in this ecosystem i think it could be used almost everywhere for example most for example europe and so on so it doesn't matter which plant is that and i yeah. think it could be a very interesting study because well people are interested in let's say water protection and so on and it's very important also but i think it would be much more interesting also to do some researches connected in water and uh, Uh, in genetics, because I think that it's really important also, because, for example, if there is some obstacle on the river and so on, so then gene flow is stopped. And also then maybe it could be a problem in the future and not only with plants, but also with another, let's say, insects and animals and so on. So I think that it would be very interesting. But who knows? Okay, <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah, cool work. Great. Um, okay, because we are actually running out of time, I'm just getting the notice that actually officially we have only 25 minutes left and there are still several posters to present. I would directly give over to the next presentation then. Um, we should have had a presentation by Isabel Madalheno, but I don't see her online and we didn't receive a file. So I guess we skip it right now and see if she joins later. And instead we directly continue with a presentation by Juan um, Cardoso who should be also with us. Yes, he is. Okay, let's look at the pollinators. Hello, everyone. My name is Juan Andres Cardoso, and I'm glad to be here at Tropentac 2020, albeit virtually. I will present a preliminary work carried out at the Alliance of Biodiversity, SEAT, in Cali, Colombia. The work is Advances in Testing Multispecies Pastures for Productivity and Environmental Benefits, with a focus on pollinators. This ongoing work is funded by Grow Colombia Project and the Research Program on Livestock of the CGIAR. Further information about our work can be found in the links shown in this slide. So, what are multispecies pastures? Multispecies pastures are pastures comprised of three or more species or functional groups. These type of systems are very uncommon in livestock production systems in tropical America. There are multiple benefits obtained from multispecies pastures and these include increased productivity of the pasture and the provision of ecosystem services such as improvement of soil health and increased of above and below ground biodiversity. Having that in mind, we established a field trial in November 2019 where we wanted to compare the productivity of multispecies pastures up to six species of grasses, legumes and forbs against that of a grass alone and a grass legume system. To compare nutritional quality and micronutrients composition of different systems. To compare changes in soil health and carbon stocks over time and finally, to record the abundance and diversity of arthropods and pollinators in different systems. This last part is important as there has been a steady decline of pollinators worldwide. In this slide, you can see two videos. On the left hand side, one showing a monoculture of grass and on the right hand side, a multispecies pasture. We install camera traps to record images of each system every minute to record presence of insects. Each popping yellow square is an insect, and here it's clearly evident that in multispecies pastures there is greater abundance of insects. We also did transit walks to collect arthropods, and the preliminary results showed that multispecies pastures had twice the number of pollinators mostly bees and bumblebees, than a grass alone or a grass legume system. 
Multispecies pastures seem to provide a more friendly environment to pollinators than a grass alone or a grass legume system. We acknowledge that we have very preliminary data. However, we aim to reignite data collection post-COVID lockdown. I hope that the presentation was clear enough. Many thanks for watching. Thank you, Juan. Thank you for this very clear presentation indeed. Um, so it's very cool. Um, interesting cameras there. Um, I've never seen an approach like this before, even though I'm also pretty much interested in insect pollination. Um, if you do these camera observations, do they mirror your data from these uh, sweep netting samples? So can you see similar abundances of Hymenoptera, Lepidoptera and so on with these cameras? Or are there yes. Yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Y yes, you actually can. The, the thing is that at the moment, there is more work trying to do that, like trying to identify the, the, the insects or whatever that is flying over there than actually go to the lab, look at the, uh, under a microscope, under a stereoscope. So, so but actually we, we, we are working on that, trying to, to, to develop some, 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 some pipeline. Yeah. To, to identify the, the arthropods and the insects that are flying over there. But at the moment, we can actually collect just numbers. Like, okay, like there are like 300 uh, insects flying like each hour. But nonetheless, I mean, having this kind of system. So the, the identification of, of, of the species, that's basically, we're far from there at the moment. <laughs> I can imagine that identification is super difficult with this, or maybe even impossible right now but having this abundances and, and densities i think that's very innovative yeah. and uh, congratulations on such an approach really yeah, cool. no, but i think that, that, that the camera was mostly for for, for illustration purposes at mm -hmm. the moment you know okay <laughs> i understand okay other further questions from the crowd Okay, I'm checking also the chat. We had a question to Dita, but maybe Dita, you could directly reply in the Q&A to this um, because we are a bit running uh, on time here as well. Um, so, okay, Juan, thanks a lot. I wish you all the best with lockdown, like all of us, so that you can continue your work as soon as possible. Yeah, stay healthy and, and continue with this. It's really cool stuff that you're doing there. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Ben. Thanks. Okay, um, so we're continuing with the next presentation. So it's really going one after the other here, but very, very nice ones. And this is going to give by Carlos um, Gonzalez, who's working on tree diversity and tree diversity specifically in uh, cacao agroforestry systems. Hello, everybody. My name is Carlos Villanueva, and I am from Guatemala, Central America. I want to take the opportunity to express that I am very happy to be in Tropenta 2020. I'm currently studying for a PhD at the Czech University of Life Science in Prague. I'm going to present the main results of a research titled Diversity of Tree and They Are Using Cocoa and the First Tree System in Alta La Paz, Guatemala. Guatemala is located between the countries of Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico, and Belize. The area where the study was conducted was Alta Verapaz, and it is in the northern part of the Guatemala. Fieldwork was developed during a 10-month period, and it includes cocoa producers from four municipalities in the department of Alta Verapaz. During this time, it was possible to evaluate the typology, richness, and diversity of trees in foreign cocoa agroforestry systems. From the point of view of food security and contribution to well-being, the system were evaluated using a snobotanical method among the local population, which allowed to establish the importance and value of each species in this location. The most important resource found there, 54 tree species belonging to 27 families were registered. Larger families are Leguminosae, Anacariaceae, and Lauraceae. 
most mentioned uses are construction materials, favor, animal folder, and medicinal juices. Conclusions. Agroforestry represents an opportunity for vulnerable areas around the world and helps to provide resources and services for population development. Additionality is strength with security for families, especially for those who live in rural areas. More importantly, this system has the capacity to host a high diversity of trees in relatively small areas, which contribute to local development and biodiversity conservation. Cocoa representative at the rural level to face the different phenomena which led the conservation of biodiversity, such as loss of natural forests degradation of ecosystems and the effect of climate change. Thank you so much. All right, um, this was a presentation by Carlos and Carlos, thanks a lot for giving this very insightful presentation on a, I think, very cool topic. Um, uh, Carlos is not online with us right now, so maybe he has problems to connect um, or so that there are some other restrictions. Um, so I would suggest that um, all the guys out there who want to ask a question, please directly use the Q&A of the Woover app or directly send Carlos a message. And we may directly continue here um, with the next presentation, um, which is given by uh, Boke Masisi, um, and which is actually on also a topic I was a bit surprised, but uh, probably it's also very innovative because it's about bamboo and using bamboo for landscape restoration. And we're looking forward to this presentation. Everyone, welcome to my contribution, Bamboo for Landscape Restoration. Together with my co-authors, my name is Boke Masisi. We have designed our study in response to the African Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative, under which 30 African countries have committed to bring more than 1 million hectares of land across Africa into restoration by 2030. In achieving this, African countries are encouraged to invest into nature-based solutions that are simultaneously safeguarding livelihoods and food security of the rural poor societies. Today, there have been emerging discussions on the role that bamboo could play as a nature-based solution and a component of landscape restoration. This growing interest on bamboo has been influenced by bamboo's fast growth, multipurpose usage, and ability to withstand degraded ecosystems. However, landscape restoration strategies are by far driven under climate policy debates where bamboo has been neglected for years, maybe due to the fact that bamboo is taxonomically classified as a grass and not a tree. This study therefore aims at investigating the role that bamboo plays into agroecological system as a multi-purpose plant. We laid our focus into its carbon sequestration potential while presenting variation in bamboo's carbon content along altitudinal gradient between indigenous and exotic species and between intensive and extensively managed bamboo ecosystems. We conducted a destructive bamboo survey in Tanzania, one of the African countries that has committed to bring 5.2 million hectares of land into restoration by 2030. We laid out 60 plots, we harvested 60 calms, measured their fresh and dry masses, and further compared their carbon content. Results further showed that bamboo biomass carbon stock and sequestration rate increases as an increase in bamboo calm dimension from lower diameter classes to higher diameter classes. Bamboo biomass Carbon sequestration rate per hectare per year was also observed to be even higher when compared to other agricultural and forest ecosystems of Tanzania. The results of ANOVA with post hoc Turkey's comparison test showed a significant variation in bamboo's carbon content along altitudinal gradient between indigenous and exotic species and between intensive and extensively managed ecosystems, where high carbon content was observed in bamboo in lower elevation, those of exotic bamboo savulgari species, and from extensively managed ecosystems. So, 
we have seen that bamboo has the capacity to sequester and store satisfactory biomass carbon content every year. But its image needs to be updated at a global perspective from viewing it as a non-valuable or unwanted inversive way to seeing it as a potential crop for sustainable future, especially for climate change resilience and for landscape restoration. This can be solved through investing into research and development so we can bring important information to policymakers concerning the potential of bamboo as a resource. I do hope that findings from this study will bring an important step towards unlocking future climate finances from bamboo-based ecosystems in Africa. However, in an ecosystem point of view, we cannot ignore the fact that bamboo expands very rapidly. And so we need to manage it very sustainably in order to avoid converting our land into a monoculture system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Poki. I mean, this is really, really innovative again. Um, and uh, maybe it's grass species that you do not talk about it a lot when you think about landscape restoration or afforestation. Um, you ended your presentation with this call to managing the bamboo sustainably so it does not turn into a monoculture. Um, could you please explain a bit more how would this look in practice? Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you, want, you want to know how to manage it sustainably? Yes, yeah. Can we do mixtures of trees and bamboo so it's more like a, a mixed stand or not a monoculture? No, no, no. no. Bamboo uh, for, are known to be inversive but not all bamboo species are inversive species. So first of all, we have to do the preventive measures before to know yeah. which species are inversive and which ones are not. So in case of intentional uses, such as for landscape restoration, we firstly have to do the risk management, seeing like how this can help. I mean, maybe if you're going to transform our land into monoculture, because bamboo grows very fast and expands very widely, and so if you mix it in an agroecosystem and care is not taken and it's inversive, it can just dominate yeah, the, the ecosystem. I think that there needs to be some, some careful consideration as well. Um, but yeah. also in carbon and using it then also maybe as building material or, or things like that. This is definitely a very interesting idea. So yeah. thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. okay. Are there any further questions right now? Looking also into the Q&As. Okay, um, doesn't seem to be the case right now. So thanks a lot, Boki, again, for uh, giving us these insights. Um, we continue. Um, the next presentation would be by um, Haitam Hashim Gibrel. I hope I spelled it more or less correctly, but I do not see him online right now either. And he also did not submit a video. So my suspicion is there also that he um, is not going to give a presentation today. Um, so in that case, I would rather continue then with the second to last presentation, which is given by um, Hanari uh, Shakli Gamal um, on the validation of X-ray densitometry um, for wood density estimation. And um, what this is all about, um, he's going to ex explain to us right now. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to present myself to you. I am Hanadi Mohamed Shawi Gamal from Sudan. I am working in the University of Khartoum, Faculty of Forestry, Department of Forest Products and Industry. I would like to present my uh, poster titled Validation of the X-ray Densitometry Method for Wood Density Determination of Acacia Sayal Species. As introduction, Wood density is a variable influencing many of the technological and quality properties of wood. It is the most important physical property. Determining the wood density values is important for the end use of wood. Uh, the X-ray technique was uh, traditionally used for uh, soft wood species wood density determination. On the other hand, limited information is available about the validation of using X-ray technique for hardwood species. The stability of using X-ray technique for the determination of hardwood density has a special significance in countries like Sudan, where only a few timbers are well known. This will enhance the investigations of the great number of the lesser known and utilized species. The matter which will fill the huge gap on information of hardwood species grown in Sudan. Therefore, 
The current study aimed to evaluate the validation of using the X-ray densitometry technique to determine the wood density of acacia cereal variety cereal. Material. The wood raw materials were collected from two rainfall zones in Sudan. Each zone was represented by 15 trees collected randomly from five stands located in two different states. The location and characterization of the study areas are summarized in figure number one, while sampling procedure is presented in figure two. Here, figure one, the raw material were collected from four states in Sudan, North Kordofan State, White Nile State, South Kordofan State, and Blue Nile State. Each zone was represented by two states. Zone number one was represented by North Kordofan State and White Nile State, while zone number two was represented by South Kordofan State and Blue Nile State. And here are the forest names of uh, from where we collect the three samples. Coming into figure number two, the sample procedure, two discs of 10 cm height were cut from each tree, and one radius was obtained from each disc and used to prepare the air dry density samples and the X-ray density samples. Methods uh, in order to achieve the study goals, two density types were measured, which are air dry density and X-ray density. For X-ray, for, for air dry density, uh, the air dry density graphometric method was adopted on the basis of DIN. For the X-ray density, the X-ray densitometry method described in Schweinberger 1988 was adopted to measure the density. Fiber 3 illustrated the X-ray densitometry method, where one wood samples grew in wooden support, two fiber angle measurement uh, using dendroscope, three and four synchro sections cutting, five the resulted 1.20 mm thickness lasses, six wood radiographic image and seven density measurement using Dendro 2003. Coming into result, the result reveals non-significant differences between the air dry density values and X-ray density values. In both cases, the wood density follows the increasing trend from base to bark. Figure 4 and 5 represent the study species air dry density versus X-ray density box blots as overall mean values as well as portions from base to bark respectively. Figure 4, the, mean, uh, the overall mean values, no significant differences were appear. And figure 5, represent uh, the mean value as motion from base to bark, which are 10%, 50%, and 90%, and the increasing trend from base to bark. This result confirms the validation of using the X-ray technique for acacia cereal variety cereal wood density and its gradient trend determination. It also promotes the suitability of using this method for other hardwood species. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Hanadi, for this very cool presentation of this technique. Definitely very important to identify more hardwood species um, in the region. Um, you got another poster presentation on a similarly related topic, and I suggest that we directly continue um, with the second video, and then we can have questions to both of these um, poster presentations um, together afterwards. So we continue directly with the second um, poster, also by Hanadi. Um, and I'm sorry for saying he presents. Obviously, it's uh, her that presents. Sorry. Hello, ladies and uh, gentlemen. First of, of all, I would like to present myself to you. I am Hanadi Mohamed Shawi Jamal from Sudan. I am working in the uh, University of Khartoum, Faculty of Forestry, Department of Forest Products and Industries. I would like to present my uh, poster titled Variation in Wood Anatomical Properties of Acacia Sayal Variety Sayal Species Grown in Sudan. As introduction, Sudan is endowed by a great variation of climatic zones with an annual rainfall extended from 25 mm in desert to over 700 mm in woodland savanna with a great variation of climatic zones Great variations are expected also in wood anatomical properties between and within species grown in each zone. This variation needs to be fully explored in order to suggest best uses for the species. Therefore, the present study 
aimed to investigate the effect of rainfall zones in some wood anatomical properties of acacia cereal variety cereal grown in Sudan. Material. Uh, the wood raw materials were collected from two rainfall zones in Sudan. Each zone was represented by 10 trees collected randomly from five stands located in two different states. The location and characterization of the study areas are summarized in figure number one, while sampling procedure is presented in figure number two. Here in, in figure number one, as we see, uh, the raw material were collected from four states in Sudan, North Kordofan State, White Nile State, South Kordofan State, and Blue Nile State. Each zone uh, was represented by two states. Zone number one was represented by North Kordofan State, White Nile State, while uh, zone number two was represented by South Kordofan State and Blue Nile State. Here is the uh, first names from where we collect our samples. Coming into figure number two, the sample procedure, uh, discs of uh, about 10 centimeters were uh, obtained from each tree, and the one radius from the central stem was cut from, uh, from each uh, disc and used to, uh, to prepare the maceration samples and the softening samples. Methods In order to measure the fiber length, Course maceration methods was adopted to macerate the woody material into individual cells, and a total of uh, 40 fiber lengths were measured per sample under microscope. And in order to, to measure the fiber and vessels diameter and lumen diameter, softening in, in autoclave method was adopted, and a transceiver section of about 10 to 15 micrometer thickness were prepared, and a total of 40 fibers and 30 vessels. Diameter and lumen diameter were measured per sample using image software. Both fibers and vessels wall thickness were calculated as wall thickness is equal to diameter minus lumen diameter divided by 2. Coming into the results, the study result reveals significant differences between zones in mature visit diameter and wall thickness as well as in mature fiber lengths. Significant differences were also observed in juvenile visits and wall sickness, fiber diameter, and wall sickness. Figure number three summarizes the effect of rainfall zones on the study species anatomical properties. As we see here in figure number three, mature visit diameter, juvenile, and mature visit wall sickness were uh, increased from the wet zone into the drier zones. It means that the higher values were observed in the drier zone. And contrary to the visit dimension, mature fiber lengths, juvenile fiber diameter, and wall thickness were decreased in the drier zone. From these results, Acacia cereal variety cereal seems to be well adapted with the change in rainfall and may survive in any rainfall zone. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Hanadi, for giving this uh, very nice two presentations and also um, everybody here in this session. We are almost finished on time, um, but I do not want to uh, end without asking Hanadi a question. Actually, um, I find it very interesting that these, this uh, plant species shows this wide variability. Do you think this could result in future speciations, so future subspecies, so different subspecies in different regions? Is this where the evolution of this plant may go in future? Hello? Yes. Can you me. hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I didn't go to the question, um, but I, I think you are asking about uh, if, if they are the, the same subspecies for both yes. water or not. Is that yeah. the question? Yes, this, uh, they are the same uh, species and subspecies, but different uh, study. In the first one, I, I studied the validation of X-ray densitometry for uh, the dead city elimination and for the second I uh, I investigate the effect of rainfall zone in the same species. Okay, but but uh, the effect of the rainfall zone, may those actually also result in different subspecies in your second study? That's what I meant. So um, ah, it, it may affect also and that's why I collect my sample from two zones to to, to, to have a, a big uh, presentation for, for oh. uh, the validation of using the X-ray. 
but uh, you are right if, if I investigate also the, the validation of using the X-ray in zone one, it may be different from zone, zone two. Yes, you are right. Okay. I didn't think about that, but it, it may be for the uh, future maybe study, but maybe also it, it is uh, useful uh, to use it in zone one, but it is not useful to use it in zone two, maybe. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, so definitely lots of interesting things for future study there as well. Thank you all. Thank you all for these very nice presentations today. Thank you all for keeping to the time. We are five minutes over, so we have to end now. Um, future questions, please ask them on the WUBA app. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for joining the session today to everybody out there. Um, let's give a bit of applause to everybody here. Thank you all. And enjoy the rest of the Tropentag and stay healthy, everybody. All the best to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, nice Thank you. evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Glad to see you Goodbye. all here. Bye. Goodbye. Stay safe. Thank you.